the recording has started. Okay, great. So, uh, welcome everyone to Young Researchers Colloquium. Our today's speaker is Oskar Stachowiak from Faculty of Physics, University of Warsaw. Oskar will tell us all about his work concerning counting paths in direct graphs. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, so hello everybody. My name is Oskar Stachowiak and I'm going to talk about direct graphs. So to begin with, graph theory is very accessible branch of mathematics. A perfect example of that is great mathematician Laszlo Lovash. Uh, he published his, his first paper about graphs uh, when he was only 17 years old. Mm. Graphs also has a connection to numerous parts of mathematics, such as representation theory, classification of finite dimensional algebras, or non uh, commutative topology. But before I'll discuss this further, I'll have to introduce a few definitions. Uh, so first of all, um, uh, we need to define a graph. So a graph, sometimes called a quiver, uh, is a quadruple where E0 and E1 are sets of vertices and edges uh, respectively. S and T are maps where S assigned to each edge its source vertex, whereas T is target. The next definition is definition of finite path. So a finite path PN is in some graph, E is a finite tuple of edges and we write P in is equal from definition to uh, E1, EN, where E1 is first edge and EN last. Those edges has to satisfy the following condition that the end of the first edge has to be equal to the end, to the beginning of the second edge and the end of second edge has to be equal to the beginning of the third and so on and so on up to EN. And now we can define the beginning and the end of the path. The beginning of the path PN, uh, which we write S of PN, is equal to the beginning of the first edge, in our case, uh, E1. Mm. And the end uh, of the path T of PN is equal to the end of the last edge in the tuple, in our case, EN. If the beginning of the path is equal to the end of the path, we call the path a loop. Uh, the next, um, we have a definition of length of a path. So uh, the length of a path is the size of the tuple. Every each edge is a path of length one, and also we consider vertices as path, finite paths of length zero. Uh, okay, so upcoming definitions I will not use in my main part of talk, but they will be useful during discussion about graphs applications. So firstly, let me define path in algebra of some graph E. Uh, so the path algebra key E of a graph E uh, is the K algebra whose underlying K vector space has as its basis the set of all finite paths in E and uh, such that the product of paths is given by the following formula. Product of two paths, uh, E1, EK, and F1, FL, is equal to Kronecker delta indexed by the end of the first path and the beginning of the second, times composition of, the, of, of those paths. In other words, the product of two paths is equal to zero if the end of the first is not equal to the beginning of the second path, and it's equal to a composed path otherwise. Uh, now we can come back to some application. So firstly, graphs are used in classification of finite dimensional algebras. Um, we know that every algebra A is isomorphic to bound quiver algebra. Uh, where bound quiver algebra is path algebra 
um, in this case, KEA uh, divided by admissible ideal. Uh, okay, so the next part of mathematics where graphs are used in is the representation theory of algebras. If you have algebra and and associate a graph EA, one may ask if someone we can use representation of this graph to obtain representation of initial algebra. The answer is yes, and I will discuss it on the next slide. Uh, the last but certainly not least, graphs are also used in Levit path algebras and graph C star algebras through paths al al algebras of extended graphs. Mm. Levit path algebras is also quotient algebra, but instead uh, of gr graph E, we take extended graph E bar. Definition of extended graph will occur on the next slide. Uh, and mm, we take, if we take uh, field to be complex numbers and ideal to be Kuhn's Kriga ideal, and then after taking uh, completion with respect to norm, we obtain universal uh, sister algebra. Mm, okay, so let's go on. Then uh, now let's define what is representation of graph, uh, of graph E. Uh, so the representation uh, of graph E is a pair of two families where the first component is a family of vector spaces indexed by vertices and the second component is the family of linear maps labeled by edges. Uh, we can also assign uh, homomorphism to some path and it's equal to composition of homomorphism assigned to, uh, to edge from this path, to edges from this path. Uh, like we can see in the picture, we have some path P, E n, uh, E1, E n, and linear map assigned to this path is composed out of linear maps assigned to each edge from this path. Mm. Uh, so now since we have representation of graph, we could try to obtain somehow representation of uh, algebra. Mm. For algebra A, which is equal to Bwant, bound quiver algebra, we obtain representation of A from representation of graph EA in the following, in the following way. A vector space uh, V on which representation of some path acts is direct sum of all vector spaces assigned to all vertices in graph EA. Uh, excuse me, could you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes I can so, hear okay. you. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. So we're, uh, okay, it's a, a direct sum of all vector spaces assigned to all vertices in graph uh, yeah. okay. uh, And how this representation of some path P acts on some vector space V mm, as follows. The result is equal to zero uh, if X does not belong to vector space assigned to the beginning of the path, and it's equal to phi p of x mm, otherwise. Mm. Uh, but our algebra A is not isomorphic to path algebra K uh, E A, but to path algebra K E A divided by ideal. So we have to take this uh, into account. Uh, we do this by assigning to each path from ideal in linear map, which is equal uh, to zero on every vector from vector space V. Okay, so next, uh, let's define as a opposite graph. Mm, the opposite graph of graph E is also a quadruple where sets E and one are the same, but map S and T are uh, swapped, which means uh, S op 
uh, is equal to t and t op is equal to mm, to s. Uh, to sum up, uh, opposite graph is a graph with the same vertices mm, as graph e, but with arrows with opposite direction. The next definition is the definition of extended graph. Mm. So let E be a graph and the extended graph is also quadruple of, uh, the extended graph of graph E is also quadruple. Mm. And it is given as follows. Mm. Uh, the set of vertices in extended graph is the same as in the graph E, but mm, the set of mm, vertices is the uh, sum of vertices E1 and edges. Uh, edges uh, I'm sorry, edges, yes, yes, edges and uh, mm, E1 star. And it's a disjoint sum. Disjoint sum of uh, edges e1, uh, set e1, and set e1 star. Uh, and what uh, is it e1 star? e1 star is a set uh, of all e stars such that uh, every e mm, belongs to e1. Mm. Also, for every e in e1, the beginning, uh, the source map of the source map from e bar of e has, is defined as a source map from uh, e acting on the same um, edge. Uh, the same is with target map. Mm, but for all uh, for all e star belonging to e1 star, we define mm, our source map as mm, the target map from uh, graph e acting on edge e, and the same is with. Uh, target map from um, extended graph. Uh, um, in different words, we can define the extended graph as this joint union of graph and uh, opposite graph um, over all vertices from E0. Uh, and here is an easy example of a graph E and extended graph mm. E bar. Mm. And uh, the graph E bar is a graph of Lorentz polynomials. And we know that after completion with respect to norm of Lorentz polynomials, we will get the systole algebras of continuous function over the circle. Okay, so now I will present a few examples of graphs. Uh, first example is graph of waxman soibelman quantum sphere. What Waxman did is he took SU, Q, N plus one divided by action of compact quantum subgroup SU, Q, N. And what he got is a set of fixed points of systal algebra, uh, and that is systal algebra of quantum sphere. Mm, very important example in compact quantum group theory and on communicative topology is when n is equal to two. <laughs> and for for this, it his graph yields to continuous function on S, U, Q, N. Q2. Uh, Q2, yes, yes. Uh, Q2, sorry. Uh, and the next example is graph of Hong-Szymanski ball. Uh, 
those balls are bounded by action spheres defined on previous slide. Uh, and for n equal to, this graph yields to Toplitz algebra t and uh, the systal algebra of Klimek Leśniewski quantum disk. Mm, the last but not least mm, is graph uh, of quantum complex projective space. Uh, here each arrow stands for countably infinite many arrows going in the same direction. Mm, the graph sister algebra uh, of these graphs is the set of all continuous function of projective space CPQ n minus one, where n stands for number of vertices. Uh, a special case is when n is equal to, and then this graph yields to continuous function on SQ2, uh, the systal algebra of standard Podlesch quantum sphere. Mm. And that would be all as regards the introduction. Mm. So let's back to combinatorics and counting paths. Uh, the space FP of E of all finite paths uh, in E, vertices included, might be infinite even E is a finite graph, both E0 and E1 are finite. Mm, the easiest example of this graph uh, with only one vertex and one uh, loop was presented on uh, fifth slide. And let's call the vertex V and the edge E. Then the space FP of E is equal to uh, vertex, then next element is path E, next path E uh, followed by path E, mm, and so on. Uh, okay, so let's back to the last. Okay. Mm. Uh, now we have easy proposition from graph theory, which I will not prove. And the proposition is, let be a finite graph, then FP of E is finite, if and only if there are no loops uh, in graph E. Mm, okay. Next we have theorem, which result is based on joint work of Hivas C2 and PM Hayas, which is a theorem which requires a very long proof and trying to prove in, in a simpler way uh, failed. Uh, although there might be some more general techniques to, to prove it. Mm. Uh, additionally, this is motivating theorem for my talk. The purpose of this talk is to prove a special, special case of such theorem with uh, change condition. Mm, namely, we have k is, uh, is not greater than one, like in this theorem, but greater than n minus one over here. And the uh, uh, theorem is uh, in uh, n minus k, sorry, yes, yes. Mm. Uh, if we have a graph E with n greater than uh, other equal to edges and no loops. Mm. And k is between one and n. Uh, then there are at most p, k, and a different paths of length k and the bound is optimal. Uh, I also will not uh, prove this theorem uh, today. Let's, let's go on. Mm. Uh, like I said before, uh, no, so, sorry, let uh, E be a graph with n um, greater than, uh, greater or equal to one edges and let k be between one and n, then there are, there are at most n to the k 
okay, power different paths of length k and the bound is optimal. So let's prove it. Mm, and the proof is very easy. Uh, mm, every path in E of length k uh, is k letter word written using n letters. So there are there are at most n to the k many of them. This bound is attained in the Hawaiian earring graph on n loops, which is presented here. Mm. Okay, like I said before, uh, we have similar, we have conjecture which is similar to the previous theorem. We have graph E with n greater or equal to edges, and we have uh, k um, between uh, one and n, um, and we are assuming loops uh, of length at least k, then there are at most k times p k and a different paths of length k and the bound is optimal. Mm, in today's talk, I will uh, prove uh, on the special case when k is greater than n minus k. But that will be on the next slide. Uh, but before we go to the main theorem, we need to prove following proposition. Mm, if any red edge repeats itself, in a path of length k, then there is a loop of length less than k. Uh, so let's prove it. If we have a path p, e1, ek, um, so if n edge repeats itself, then e1, a, a, ei is equal to ej for some. Um, i which is less than j mm. but this means the beginning of e mm, i is equal to the beginning of ej but from the definition of path we know that uh, it is equal to the end of mm, e j minus one so the path uh, P E J is a loop. Uh, indeed, we have the we have that the beginning of the path is equal to the beginning of its first edge, which is the beginning of E I. And from above, we know that it is equal to the end of E J minus one, and this is equal to the end of path. The smallest possible. Uh, i is 1 and the largest j is k. Uh, so the maximal length of above loop is k minus 1, which is less than k. Uh, OK, so the main result. Mm, like I said before, this is only a special case uh, because k is greater or equal n minus k. Uh, so um, let it be a graph with n greater or equal um, one edges. k is between n and n minus k. We are assuming uh, loops of length at least k. Then there are at most k times n to n minus k power, different paths of length mm, k uh, in graph E and the graph uh, and the bound is optimal in particular of n greater equal to and k uh, equal to n minus one, we have at most two times n minus one different paths of length k and the bound is optimal. Mm, of course, the bound is optimal because the, the following graph has exactly k times 2 to the n minus k paths of length k. Mm, the number is such for the following reason. 
Um, we have exactly n minus k double edges from here to here. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we start the path at the beginning of EA, then we have two choices, then again two choices, uh, and we have those two choices n minus k many times. Uh, this gives us number 2 to the n minus k k power. Then um, we continue only in the unique way. So this gives us 2 to the n minus k power paths of length k. But since our path is arranged in a loop, uh, we can begin our path uh, in any of k vertices. Hence, this multiplication by k. Okay, so let's go on. Mm. Uh, firstly, this is this theorem is trivial for n equal one. Indeed, for n equal one, it follows that k is equal one as well due to the previous in inequalities over here. If n is equal to 1, then k is greater or equal to 0 and is less than 1 or equal to 1. So it has to be 1 because k is natural. Okay. So now we have a now we have to answer a question how many different paths of length 1 are in this graph for n equal 1. Uh, of course, the answer is one because we have only one edge. So let's check this with formula from theorem. Mm. As we can see, our calculation is square with formula from theorem mm, because if we have one here and two to the one minus one is zero, so it's one. So one times one is one. Uh, okay, so now we can assume n is greater or equal to. Um, we can always construct a graph with a path of length uh, k um, because we are not interested in other graphs uh, because those graphs won't give us maximal uh, number paths since there is no path of length k. Uh, okay, so we have a graph with some, uh, some path p of length k. Mm. Okay, this path can be a loop or an open path. In either case, there are precisely n minus k remaining edges that we can use to construct more paths. Mm. Let's call the set of all remaining edges f. And path in our graph has to be constructed from l edges from f and k minus l edges from the path P. Mm. For example, we have one path P, uh, E1, uh, EK, mm. and second path of length also K uh, is composed out of K mm, minus one edges with which are not in the first path, and what one edge from path P, mm, namely EJ. Uh, so now we uh, need to show that any path of this kind is uniquely determined by the choice of L edges from F uh, and its starting vertex. Okay, so firstly, using um, prior lemma, um, we know that any path Q of length k open or closed has to be composed out of k different edges. Otherwise, we would have a loop of length shorter than k, and this is forbidden due to our assumptions. Mm, once we choose uh, these k edges, then there is only one way we can arrange them into a path of length k if q is open, and k different ways if q is a loop. Okay. Uh, in each case, when the first edge is chosen, there is only one way we can choose the following edges to form a path. Uh, hence, to get a path 
of length k in the first case, we have to choose the first edge um, of q as the first edge of our path. Otherwise, we would obtain a path which is shorter than k. So there is only one such path of length k, q itself. Mm, whereas in the second case, we can choose k different edges as the starting edge of path um, to form a path of length k um, out of given k, k edges. Uh, nonetheless, the pain is uniquely fixed by this choice. Mm, uh, to sum up, once we choose k different edges, there are at most k different paths built out of them. Uh, it remains to determine in how many different ways we can choose k different edges, assuming that l edges are chosen from f and k minus edges are chosen from p with l equal to uh, equal from 0 to n minus k. Okay, so in first a special case where L is equal to zero, we are choosing um, all edges from the path P. Uh, then the path P has um, the path P has k edges, so uh, it's k over k, which is equal to one. We can denote it as n minus k over zero. Uh, in other ex Extreme uh, in other extreme where L is equal to K, then it follows that N, mm, N is also uh, N capital N is equal to mm, two times K and L is equal to N minus K. Uh, in this case, all edges mm, are chosen from set F. The set F has n minus k edges, so it is n minus k over k and is equal to 1. Mm, because in this case n minus k is equal to k. Uh, mm, in other cases, mm, uh, either our path p uh, the one we've chosen in the very beginning uh, is a loop or not. Uh, there is always only one way we can connect disconnected subpaths composed out of edges which lie beyond a uh, base path or extend a subpath made out of edges um, in set F using edges from path P to um, uh, to form a path of length k. Uh, indeed, even our mm, base path p mm, is a loop, there is only one way we can connect disconnected vertices on path p without creating path of length greater than k. Mm, hence the choice of k minus l edges from P is uniquely fixed when we chose L edges from F. Uh, therefore, there are n minus k over L many choices. Mm. Okay. Uh, so, to sum up, Mm, the number of possible choices is always n minus k over l. Uh, now, as l can vary from 0 to n minus k, there are at most 2 uh, to n minus k. Mm, many choices of k different edges, which we can use to construct a path of length k. Uh, and to obtain a formula um, um, Dorm the theorem, we have to combine this statement with the previous fact uh, uh, that 
for each choice of k different edges, there are at most k different paths of length k composed out of these edges. Mm. And this is the end of the proof and my presentation. And I'm looking on the clock and I'm surprised because last time it took me about uh, almost hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this time I will. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, that is right. If you, uh, uh, you have still quite at some time, if you so want I, to I take it. I have a suggestion, Oscar. Uh, why don't you, because that's the end of the proof and that's the end of the slides. But uh, one thing which you might explain, perhaps using whiteboard, is why this theorem is a special case of a conjecture. I mean, it's not uh, anything difficult, but uh, uh, it, it's good to show. Ah, yes, thank you, Alex, yes. Uh, sorry, I was too far away from my mic. Can you hear me all right now, Alex? Because I had a yes, chat info. Thanks. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm using a different laptop and here the mic is much weaker. So what, what I would uh, suggest uh, as, as we have time uh, as to, to, to show, because maybe it's not immediately clear, is that this P and K in the special case where K is greater or equal to N minus K is indeed two to the power N minus K. Okay, I uh, can do this, but I need a minute to. Oh, that uh, okay. Because you also you didn't really explain this number uh, p and k. Not that it is difficult to comprehend, but uh, it would be nice to draw a picture. Okay. So. Let me come back to the definition. Uh, a yeah. number, uh, so if we denote capital N as N, uh, small n times k plus um, R, when R is between zero and k, min k minus one, then there are at most pk uh, different paths. Um, and this is the formula. Um, in our case, if k is greater or equal n minus k, mm -hmm. then small n uh, is one. Mm -hmm. uh, so here in these brackets, we have one plus one, which is two. And r is precisely n minus k. Uh, n minus k, uh, we have in this bracket, we have the power n minus k. Uh, and this factor is equal to one because small n is uh, is one. So this mm -hmm. is our um, special case, but since we are allowing loops, then the conjecture is saying that we have to also multiply this by k. Uh, keep this slide, uh, Oscar. So this is a slide one I quickly uh, come on. No, 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 the, the next one. The next one, yes. Uh, this? This? Uh, this one, yes. Yeah, okay. yes. With the Hawaiian earring, please. Uh, if you like, draw it. It's, it's, it's a good slide to show how combinatorial exchanges uh, with your assumptions about loops. When you assume no loops, then you have this magic number P and K. Uh, which is kind of obvious to guess because you can easily write a graph which uh, optimizes this bound, which has exactly that many paths of uh, length k. It, it's sort of like uh, dealing cards in a casino in, in Las Vegas and uh, you give one card to every player, but at the end of the day, if you have uh, if a number of, of players does not divide the number of cards, well, then there are some players that will have one card more. And this is exactly how you build this uh, optimizing graph. And then obviously the number you get is this magic P and K. Uh, but now the moment you assume that you allow loops, the combinatorics changes drastically. You have a much bigger number. You have this two, sorry, N to the power K. So this grows far more rapidly. And uh, you, you realize this bound by, by an extremely simple graph, a graph which is actually important in sister algebra because it gives us the Kuhn's algebras. Uh, as graphs, sister algebras or subgraphs. 
that from the combinatorics point of view, when you assume that you have can allow loops, so the situation trivializes, it's it, it just obvious. Um, but now when you go in between, and this was original Oscar's idea, uh, that, that how about uh, allowing loops, but not all loops, since we're interested in pairs of length k, and maybe a, a good benchmark for the length of a loop that is allowed is exactly a loop of length k. So what happens when we allow loops, but loops uh, which are at least of length k. And then we have something strange happening, combinatoric changes, but it is neither this sort of uh, trivial combinatorics in the case where we have no loops, nor the combinatorics that we had before uh, without any loops whatsoever. It's something else. You just have this factor of multiplying things by k, which is due to this additional freedom that your paths of length k can be arranged in a loop. And uh, when they are arranged in a loop, then you can start this path at k many different edges, which gives you this k many different opportunities when there's additional factor of multiplication by k. Mm -hmm. That's my comment on, 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 on uh, this slide. Uh, OK, so I think I can start to uh, share another screen. Uh, okay, so here I stopped sharing mm -hmm. and I start share a screen. Okay. Okay, so I can. Okay, so now my sh screen should be shared. Yep. Okay, so can you see my screen? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so our uh, special case is we have a graph E with n bigger than two many edges. Uh, and k is between n minus k and n. And what is special about this, um, this case is that if we construct a minimal, uh, if we construct a path k, uh, path p, which is equal to a tuple e1, ek, um, so length of this path is k. Uh, And this could be a loop or not. Nevertheless, uh, E1, EK, uh, we have precisely um, N minus K uh, remaining edges. And we could have two cases. If this uh, is equal to K, then we could construct a path uh, out of these remaining edges, but only one of length k. Uh, but if k one is one or k, one or k, depending whether it would be a loop um, or... yes, one mm, one path which could be a loop. So we have k different uh, paths of length k, but we have only k different edges. Uh, so the other example, actually the other part of this case is when k is strictly greater than n minus k. Uh, then if we have uh, copy paste, then uh, from all remaining edges, uh, we can't construct any new paths of length k. So we somehow have to use those edges from uh, path p. Uh, so this is, um, this makes this problem easier than general case. Because 
those uh, edges, any new path has to be uh, built from L edges from remaining edges and N minus K edges from uh, base. K minus L. Of, K minus edges from um, base path P. Okay. So, okay, so here changing uh, uh, from the situation when you have no loops or, or when you have loops of length at least K did not change much of the combinatorics because yes, it's true that if this base path P would be arranged into a loop, which is allowed. Still, you have only one way to connect the subpaths built out of edges from F if you want to get a path of length uh, K, right? Because of course you can go around in a circle, but then uh, the resulting path would be far too long. So even though you might have a loop here, still, if you want to get a path of length K, uh, if you want to uh, uh, extend, uh, connect the subpass from, from F into a path of length K, there is only one way to do it. There's only one way to join uh, the distinct uh, vertices where one subpath from F ends and another subpath from F uh, begins. And of course, one of the subpath must, might, might be trivial. This is why we talk about an extension, right? You can, if it is an outgoing uh, edge, then you can extend it backwards in one way. If it is uh, incoming edge when you can extend it forward only in one way. So this, this is why this combinatorics is only n minus k for L. Like n minus k choose L. The, 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 that's the source of it. And you don't have, you, you are not choosing a, a k from n, right? Because the first part of the proof would say, all right, uh, uh, we can choose, um, everything is determined by the choice of k different edges. And once we choose k different edges, we can have at most uh, k different paths out made out of these uh, different edges. And and so then we'd say, all right, so the bound is uh, n choose k times k. Well, this is of course a bigger number than than uh, the number we obtain. Right? This is not an optimal bound. And the optimal bound is shown in this way that we we, we argue that even in the special cases everything boils down to n minus k choose L and, and you have no freedom of choice for uh, taking uh, these additional missing uh, edges from our base path P to complete our path that we built uh, into a path of K. Yes, I, uh, during, uh, when you were talking, I, I just paint some graph where you extend a path. You can also extend in a different way. So you have, uh, like you said, uh, you extend it backwards. So, um, and the, the last example, if we have a loop, we can. Um, Either way, there is only one way, one way to, to do it because if we would like to go around, we would make a path longer than K because our loop is of length K. Mm -hmm. so, we, so we can go around this loop. Uh, Oscar, if you give, um, if you show your slides again, uh, mm -hmm. These examples from non-commutative topology, then maybe I can quickly comment on them. Yes, of course. Mm, yeah. Okay. So, so uh, of course, uh, all this is not needed for a combinatorial uh, result. Uh, we do it kind of uh, for the sport of it. But um, here, I just want to argue one more time that uh, these graphs are very important in non-commutative topology. And uh, Baxman, Sobelman quantum spheres were obtained, as Oscar explained, from quantum groups. This is how Baxman, Sobelman divided, de defined them. Uh, this follows the, the, the classical intuition that you can think about the odd spheres as homogeneous uh, spaces for 
special unitary groups. And uh, in, 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 indeed, uh, if, you, if you take uh, uh, n equal to two, then your graph is uh, very simple. You have only two vertices, uh, two loops at each of the vertices, and one edge going, say, say, from the left to the right vertex. And this is the famous Voronovich SUQ2, because uh, S3, well, topologically, SU2 group is just a three sphere. And uh, this quantum deformation of, a, of all the spheres obtained by Waxman Sogelman agrees with Voronovich's definition of SUQ2. So this is a very, very important, this is like the most famous quantum group, I would say. And uh, you can see it uh, explicitly via its graph. Uh, then, uh, Oscar, please switch the slide to the next one. Of course. Yeah, then, then you can see, uh, then you can see um, the, 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 the Hong Shemansky, well, oh, by the way, for the previous graph, uh, this is, I, I want to make sure that you understand, uh, uh, because Hong Shemansky spheres were defined within the realm of graph sister algebras, okay? But Waxman Sogelman spheres uh, were much older. And this is highly non trivial to prove that uh, the Waxman Sogelman sphere uh, sister algebra is isomorphic to such a graph sister algebra. This is a lot of uh, heavy representation theory on a Hilbert space to prove it. And this was done by Hong and Shemansky. And only when you use heavily representation theory uh, and, and you prove that indeed such two sister algebras are isomorphic, mind you, these isomorphisms are non algebraic typically. Okay. Uh, and they are, this is more like saying, aha, we have two faithful representations, but they're unitarily conjugated on the same Hilbert space. So uh, that, that's not an algebraic argument. Um, Okay, so let's now go back to, to the balls. So, so here for n equal uh, two, you get the famous Tetlitz graph. So you have only two vertices, one loop at the first vertex and one outgoing edge. And that's, uh, that's actually the same as the universal sister algebra generated by one um, isometry. And again, our classical intuition agrees because what is a two dimensional ball? Well, it's a, it's a disk. And uh, this way you get your, uh, a very, very important sister algebra as a very special um, example. And you can also see in what sense Oscar was mentioning it, but, but actually having these graphs, you can really explain it. In what sense uh, the, the, these spheres are the boundary spheres of these balls? Well, um, remember that the Gelfand functor is contravariant. So if you include a compact house of space as a compact subspace in another compact house of space, at the level of sister algebras, you have a map going the other way around. Okay, so if X is included in Y, then you have a, a map going from C of Y into C of X. It will be a subjection if the other one was an, an injection. So if you want to describe the boundary sphere of a, of, of, of a ball in terms of sister algebras, it will be a quotient map, right? It will be a subjection from one sister algebra onto another. And here you can explicitly see if you kill this last vertex, which has no loop attached, and when you kill all edges that end at this vertex, you will get exactly the graph as on the previous slide. And this would correspond that if you have, if you have say, two n-dimensional quantum ball, uh, and, and, and uh, then you kill this vertex and all edges which end over there. I mean, these are generated in a sister algebra. You just put them to zero and the rest remain as it is. You, you have a sister projection, and this will be exactly two n minus one Waxman Sogoma quantum sphere as a boundary sphere of a Hong uh, Shimansky ball. And another thing that you can do, if you look at the, the spheres, remember how you construct um, projective spaces. Uh, complex projective spaces are obtained as quotients uh, by the diagonal action of a circle on odd dimensional spheres. And in fact, this is exactly how we're defined by Waxman Sogolin. So Oscar, please switch the slide to the next one. I don't think so, okay. Yeah. And, and you see before this, when we had a sphere, there were no, no infinity decorations on the edges, but every vertex had a loop, okay? And this is, in fact, what happens when you go to fixed point sisters of algebra. So, so you have a natural circle action on all graph sister algebras, in particular on the Waxman Sorbonne quantum sphere sister algebra. Uh, when you can compute the fixed point sisters of algebra, it happens to be again a graph sister algebra, but now loops are gone. We are just phased out by, by the circle action. And uh, somehow to make thing, things work, uh, these edges, which are just single edges, are uh, replaced by countably infinitely many edges, and you have a nice AF sister algebra. And this is the sister algebra of complex projective space. Of course, one dimensional complex projective space is just a two sphere, 
and it co coincides with a very famous endo construction of uh, Podlesh from, I don't know, like three decades ago. Uh, and you can ask, well, why do we bother? What's the upshot of um, taking known sister algebras and recasting them in terms of graphs? Well, the short answer is that uh, graphs are particularly useful uh, when you try to unravel the K theory of, uh, of a sister algebra. So, the, the, for instance, the K theory of quantum of, of complex projective spaces is very interesting. These were seminal papers from the 60s by like Pia Todd of, of Adams, some, well, some of the most famous papers in mathematics they write about K theory of CPNs. And uh, uh, you, 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 of course, K1 is zero, only, only P0 here is important. So you look at, at generating projections. Classically, there are some appropriate classes of vector bundles or differences thereof, if you want to have a nice picture. Uh, so, so this is, there is a very beautiful topology in, involved uh, in here. And uh, amazingly enough, uh, not only that uh, these subtleties of the classical pictures are recovered in the quantum deformation uh, with the help of graphs, but in fact, picture simplifies. You see, uh, of course, Oscar didn't give you conscrega relations, but uh, you can just uh, um, take it for granted right now that every vertex stands for a projection in your sister algebra, okay? To every vertex, this, uh, to every vertex you assign a projection. And to every edge, you, you assign a partial isometry uh, whose range projection is exactly the projection assigned to uh, the vertex where your edge ends. So this is roughly speaking the first thing which Kuhn's relations do for you. And lo and behold, this is absolutely amazing and completely quantum, impossible in the classical case. Uh, the, the generators of your K0 uh, group, uh, because K0 of CPN is uh, Z to N plus one. So it's a free group on N plus one many generators. Um, and and uh, here, this is given by, by the projections we are already in the sister algebra. So this couldn't be any simpler. And, and uh, there are some also general theorems that tell you that, uh, well, uh, you can always obtain K groups uh, out of uh, projections that are inside your, your sister algebra. So you, you have the calculations of K theory of, of a sister algebra, which can be very difficult sometimes. Uh, for instance, it, it was a, a long time to compute K-theory of multiple but quantum projective spaces that are not graph system of us. Um, and, and here, this is algorithmic. This is, uh, this is an immediate story. You give me a graph and the computer can compute K0 and K1 group. Uh, but it's even better because you can even understand uh, the geometrical role of generators uh, of, of K0. You can nail them down and write them down very explicitly and do computations with them. So this is sort of a raison d'etre of, of graphs to study graph sister algebras. And uh, if you are not so much maybe interested in quantum groups and quantum group topology, uh, let me mention that there is this famous Elliott's classification program of sister algebras. And uh, it's basically done in the case of simple sister algebra, I mean, nuclear, simple, uh, unical, and so on. Uh, but but, but the, the challenge was, well, can we remove this word simple, okay? How about some sister algebras that have ideas? And uh, the most tangible way to attack this problem is by graph sister algebras. And on this Wednesday, we'll have um, a talk about classification of graph uh, sister algebras, which is a like, very nice attack and very big progress in classification of the theory of sister algebras going beyond uh, the simple case. Okay, my goodness, it's already over time. This is what happens when you allow me to speak. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, thank you very much for the, for the talk and the extensive comments. And uh, maybe we have uh, time for a very short question from the audience, if there is any. And if not, then uh, let me thank you uh, all uh, once again uh, for attending this talk. Uh, and uh, let me uh, tell you that now we will have a, a break and we will resume our, uh, our Young Researchers Colloquium in the second half of the February. Okay. Okay. Thank you.